I am Andrew Marucci and Dominic Favaz behind the camera. We'll be interviewing Mr. Robert B. Phillips and it's January 14, 2003. Can I have your name? Bob Phillips. And where were you born? In Oriskany, New York. What's your birthday? March 12, 1947. Where do you go to high school? Oriskany? Oriskany High School. Uh, did you enlist? Yes. Why? Why? Yeah. At the time, it's something you did. It's, you know, times have changed. But. Could you tell me a little bit about basic training? You know, where was it? When? Where was it? Yeah. It was Paris Island, Paris South Island. Carolina, then North Carolina. Probably one of the most traumatic things I've ever went through, I mean, to that point. Could you tell me a little bit about it? We start out by getting your ass kicked when you get off the bus. And uh, it's a whole new world. You become a nothing. You start out as a nothing. It's to break down every individual into not themselves, I guess, so that you'll follow orders regardless. Uh, you indicated that you were you served in the HST. Is yes. that some sort of demolition team? No, it's helicopter support team. I see. It was uh, actually first shore party battalion, and for Vietnam, it was changed during World War II. Uh, shore party and the Navy beach masters were going to beach more or less direct traffic. Since the only beach landing was in 1965 in Vietnam, here now you've got a whole unit. You know, to spare more or less. Uh -huh. And the helicopters came in, vertical envelopment, stuff like that. So, in their infinite wisdom, the Marine Corps won't waste anything, <laughs> even manpower, came up with this. What I was was a ground pounder with a radio. I would bring choppers in to evacuate the wounded and bring in our resupplies. Were you sent to a specific unit? I was attached to many different units. Uh, they had a little deal of going. I went up with 3rd Marines. I was 1st Marine Division. They put me ADCOM, which is Additional Command, to 3rd Marine Division up at Quezon. I was hooked up with 2-3 uh, Echo, which is 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines Echo Company. Money saving into that was we didn't get any TAD pay or temporary additional duty pay. We were just ADCOM. So I didn't get a dime more, but I was with a great unit. And then when we went back south, I worked with 1st Marines, 2nd Marines. So when did you arrive in country? Uh, it was March, let me think, two days after my birthday, March 14th, 1968. And where? Denang. Could you describe your typical day in Vietnam, what you go through for the course of the day? It, that's hard. <laughs> it's hard to explain. It depends on where you were. Well, just give me an example. In Da Nang. In Da Nang. Rear area. Uh -huh. Chicken shit. Bullshit. Nonsense. I know I'm not supposed to swear, but no, I'm no, going to no, no, no. But We had rear echelon officers back in there that were still locked in with spit and polish, stuff like this. Nobody uh, has a spare moment, fill sandbags, do something. Uh, a lot of them were not realistically actually involved, more or less. Mm -hmm. My unit commander had absolutely no idea what we did out in the field. He had no idea. He was just, we had a lot of officers that were sent back there because they failed in regular infantry units. See. And uh, it was really more or less nonsense. Really? Uh, when did you first come under fire? Uh, that would be shortly after I got there. I was with the Lima Company, 37, 3rd Tag, 7th And uh, we were out here what they call the Happy Valley. We had names for everything over there, Charlie Ranch, uh -huh. Happy Valley, Elvin Valley. We were uh, supposedly a pushing force all day long. We started out just before daybreak. 
waded across. I think it was uh, the Perching River. And uh, we actually started pushing every hunt drive deer. That's what we were doing. <laughs> we were supposedly pushing the gooks. And we had blocking forces set up. See. We went hour upon hour, no contact, no contact, and then around. Oh my God, it must have been 5.30, 6 o'clock at night, we came through a small hill. And I distinctly remember seeing the women and children around. They almost seemed like they were cracking peanuts or something. They had something they were putting in. There were no men around. We asked, you know, where the men were, got the usual response, which is come yuck, which means I don't understand, which was usually bullshit. Uh, the point man, our point man, saved a lot of us. For some reason, I don't know if it was frustration from humping all night and all day or whatever, but there was a water bowl tied up. A water, by, a water bowl by a tree line he took a crack at it. Oh, I see. Okay. And the gooks had an L-shaped ambush set up there. When he shot, they thought, you know, he spotted them, they opened up, we lost him and probably three or four other guys. Had he not shot, our whole company would have been out in the middle of that race pad. He would have been slaughtered. Sure. So that, that was a very strange initiation. We had one one uh, gook officer we captured. We knew he was an officer, soft hands, well fed. Yeah, uh -huh. You know, I knew he spoke English because I said to a buddy of mine, we were guarding him while we were taking the perimeter, making the perimeter. And we were all pretty well fed up. And I said, I know the bastard speaks English. Why don't we cut his balls off and find out? And he just looked. Gave us a look. I knew he knew. And the thing was, <clears throat> by the time it started to get dark, we had to move the hell out of there. We never left their dead or wounded, but we did have their flag jackets and helmet liners, and we did have to burn them. So well, the enemy wouldn't get them. We couldn't, I couldn't get a bird in for anything more than our wounded and our dead. I couldn't get them burned into come to what they call retrograde great gear. So to deny it to the enemy, which probably wouldn't use it anyway, I mean, because flag jackets did nothing yeah. except to weigh you down and, and you know, uh, like I said, I'd probably rambling on somewhat. No, if it's I get on the subject of well, flag going. jacket. No, please, and, keep going. Flag okay. jacket, oh, designed by some genius back home for somebody that, uh, yes, they're great, they're great if uh, you're getting, let's say, mortar fire or something like that, you want a little bit more protection, but don't strap it on some poor son of a bitch that's got to go out and hunt the mountains and jungle and stuff like that because you're going to kill them. How much did they weigh? Ours were, oh, I wouldn't even guess for everything was weight, I'd say but probably 10, 15 pounds or better. They were plate. What they were was the ours, the army, the doggies. I <laughs> was marine. If you could get a hold of the doggy black jacket, they were great because they were soft. The theory was they were, I think they were fiberglass, and they were, if a shell or a fragment or a bullet hit, it would compress. Where ours were the old plate, like turtle shit. Matter of fact, my black jacket, since I had to carry the radio, if I wore the flak jacket, with the radio on, it would bang me in the back of the head, or bang up on my helmet, so we'd cut the flak out of the back. That's it. And then whoever was carrying the radio that day, because we operated in one, two, or three man teams, uh -huh. he got that flak jacket just so it could sit right. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, where were you during Tet? I got over there just after Tet. When I got over, the Tet was in. Uh, first of January for their New Year and all that. I went, after I was out with the uh, Lima 37, I came back and then I was reassigned with 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines, Echo Company, and that was at Quezon and the surrounding area. That was uh, a shithole is what it was. What it was, was it within range of, we called it Cold Rock, it was Karak Laos, within range of their artillery, gook artillery operating in a supposedly, quote, neutral country. So we were a target for that in rocket attacks, and we weren't really holding a hell of a lot of anything there. It was just that, uh, oh, they did abandon it after I got wounded. 
but uh, it's one of those things that's ours, we'll keep it until, you know, as long as we can, I guess, and, and it was very, we operated all around Quezon, Quezon proper, uh, the main base and all that, was orange clay, bunkers, and we held it with a hell of a lot less men, I mean, we had orders not to shoot unless the group came through the wire. We were sorely outnumbered, and we were holding. Well, you put a two-man bunker, and you've got another two-man bunker a good 40 yards away. You're not going to, you know, really hold a hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. And I can remember sitting there when they did hit with the rockets. If they hit on one end, you'd watch. You know, because they're hitting that end. Now, if they're hitting your end, you're shitting, getting, you're ducking. Try to get in under the ground somewhere, is in a ditch, in a bunker, in a trench, and they're watching. And our dump run, we had a guy a short time we killed on a dump run. Christ, he only had about a month or so left. Actually, they take a PC, which is a little truck, and all that, throw the garbage on, and the dump, because the snipers and that. The truck would never stop. It would zoom out and kick the shit off the map and get the hell out of there, you know. It was really a uh, really bad scene. We operated a lot in the hills. Matter of fact, Foxtrot Ridge, where I got wounded on, was named Foxtrot Ridge because Fox Company, 2nd time, 3rd Marines got overran and we went up with Echo. I mean, Echo went right up on line, which is something that you see in the movies and you don't usually see in Vietnam. They actually went up on line, which means you Men strung out, pull automatic, taking the goddamn hill back. And uh, I ran into a guy who, uh, one of my two, we called him Teamies. His name was Humphrey. He was shell shocked, his radio was blown to shit. He was with Fox when they got overran. It was really a, really a mess. I remember one stupid ass lieutenant, I brought a bird in to get the wounded out. And I could only get one bird in. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get his dead. And the dead were there. And it sounds callous, but he came up screaming at me. He wanted the dead on and the wounded that could walk to walk out. And I said I would get the wounded out because the dead were dead and they will be dead. I'll get your dead out. But not now. Not this bird. We're going to get the guys got a chance out. It sounds callous, but that's that's... Actually, they were what they call it. It sounds callous, but a routine medevac. Routine medevac means you're either slightly wounded or you're dead. Now, priority medevac, that puts you within probably, oh, you could probably make it four or five hours. Emergency medevac. Emergency medevacs came first recon, then scout dogs. Then wounded if you had a scout dog with you. <laughs> or if you had recon out in the field. I can tell you a story about that that happened with Contiana in a minute too, but anyway, they were routine medevacs. I did get them out the next day. My priorities were the living get out first. One time at Contiana, that's when I was with I think two one up there, which is right on the DMZ. And we got hit and I had a Scalp dog handler, the scalp dog. Well, before we went out, he came up to me and informed me, or asked me, did I know priorities as far as scalp dogs, this, that, and the other, and that his scalp dog would come before <coughs> any men and everything else. And I told him not to worry about it because I would personally shoot his fucking, pardon me, I would okay. personally, personally, personally shoot. His dog, if I had room for one pack, that's what we call him. Bert would come in and say, uh, I can take three packs, means three people, three bodies, three whatever. If I only had room for one, I'd shoot the dog. If I had a, a guy to go out, the sad comedy of the thing was the dog walked him into a command detonated booby trap and he got a little, like, sore with flesh wound. And I had a bird coming in. <laughs> I had a bird coming in. The bird had room for six packs. I only had him and the dog in the KIA. 
I looked him right in the eye and I said, okay, I only got room for one pack. Who goes? You were the dog. <laughs> Big turnaround. <laughs> Big turnaround. But that shows you the mentality a lot of times of uh, the whole affair. I know from your questionnaire you're pretty, you know, uh, you don't relate to the politicians. Can you elaborate on that? You can never have, you can't fight a war when you take out of the field commander's hands the right to do anything, call them an airstrike or, or anything like that. You can't put that over 12,000 miles away in Washington, D.C. with some bureaucrat and let him call the shots. He's not there. I had a, a real shit experience out at Contiana on the DMZ. We got hit with 152 artillery, it's 152 millimeter. Sound like a freight train coming in. Uh, you can't imagine the sound. Um, it's like a, a, a screaming freight train. We had two phantoms come up, drop the smoke screen because we, <laughs> at the time, had a ceasefire going or some horse shit from Washington. They could have blown the gun away. We ran back to Contien. We had to run out of range of this artillery because we could only get two phantoms up there to drop a smoke screen. So we could run. Not bombs. The gooks never respected a ceasefire. You know. And if we wanted a ceasefire, why the hell were we out there? Why the hell did we go out there and put ourselves in harm's way, for Christ's sakes, if we're having a ceasefire? Why don't we just sit? That's, that's Lyndon Johnson at one time, if he'd have flown over there, would have shot his ass down. Without, without a doubt, and without a uh, tear shed. I mean, I've read since. I've read McNamara's whole shit and, and stuff like this. The, the, now he's, you know, coming forth with all the screw-ups and everything else. They knew when they were doing it. It was, it was all politics. We could send a convoy down any road. And Gulf Oil was over there. They had convoys running and all that. And if we had our convoy in front of theirs, the groups would hit us in the front. If we had it in the rear of theirs, we could hit in the rear. If we were in the middle, we'd get in the middle. They wouldn't get touched. Out in Da Nang, there were huge, huge storage tanks for oil. Knock them off with a 50 cal with a tracer. Not touched. Didn't get touched. I had heard one time that NSA Da Nang, Naval Support Activity, the ammo dump, was giving the Gooks small arm ammo if they wouldn't hit them. Now, this sounds, it can't happen, it's ridiculous. Go by there. All they got is friggin' chain link fence, a little bit of wire, and not many people holding it, and they're not getting hit. So now your mind starts saying something, which this is true. So when it blew up, Oh, a year or so later, when I was out with the Arbans, we heard the explosions, and, and I don't know if they ever determined what did it. I heard uh, they had some civilians burning brush or something, and it caught on, but I swear to Christ to this day that one of our guys probably blew the son of a bitch up. It's just, uh, and it's a shame a lot of people died, but like I say, you take us, the average guy over there was nothing more than a um, working class. Didn't have too many college kids at all. Um, you start thinking just on common sense, it's got to be true. I mean, Christ, they're hitting us. They're hitting us when we're more heavily armed than these people are. It's, it's all the mentality. The mentality with a sniper. The mentality with a sniper is this. If he hasn't hit anybody, don't send a killer team out for him because he can't shoot. Because if you kill him, he may get replaced by somebody that can shoot. But what if you're the poor son of a bitch that he gets lucky and hits? I mean, this is where common sense comes in. All right, so he missed me, so that's fine. We're not going to go after him, so when you come through, let's hope he misses you. You know. Can you tell me about any officers that stick on your mind, good or bad? Yeah, I had a, a few officers that were bad, and I can't remember their names. I had one, I don't know if it was his fault or not, I mean, he was a Mormon. Didn't let us, when we were in our rear area, he couldn't have any girly pictures or anything like that. He got relieved command of his command out in the field. I forget who the hell I was with then. 
Luckily, we had some high brass flying over and all that, and he had taken a couple of men down to pick breadfruit. Breadfruit are, are oh, they're like this. The goose used to use them. They cut them up, and they supposedly taste like bread, you know. Uh -huh. And this is how much of a half what this guy was. He'd flown out, God knows why, to check on us. He had no goddamn idea what the hell we were doing anyway. And we got lucky. He got early. early. We had a lot of, like I said, a lot of officers that were sent back from, from regular ground infantry units and stuff like that because they had a price on their head because they fucked up on the field. So rather than have them, you know, the next time they got in a firefight, they would be gone. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of, uh, I'm not saying they were all bad officers, the infantry units had some good officers, they had some fools. I know Contian one time we had a second lieutenant, we were pinned down by a machine gun nest. And it was like an idiot's movie, John Wayne movie, grabbed this 45, says, come on, come with me. And he stood up and got stitched. He's dead. The RDFO called in artillery and we blew the goddamn gun away. I mean, where's the thinking here? Yeah, it's the years. We had a second lieutenant out on, out on the DMZ that did. I had to keep track of where the hell I was. And my compass and my map, shoot a grid if I had to bring a bird in. Artie uh, F.O. had to bring, he had to know where the hell he was, the air F.O. We had this one second Louis, and I can remember uh, this, what we called him Jimmy Hendrix, his name was Henderson. But the Artie F.O. came up to me and asked me if I'd shot an animal lately. I said, no, why? I said, the, <laughs> the DMZ is actually split up. Our side, their side, and the Z here, there were three lines. We were over on their side, which would, to our politicians, be considered an act of war, but, you know. Yeah. So we had to get the hell out of there, and then, the, but then, you know, and the lieutenant, because he was new, uh, we called him the 90-day wonder. Yeah. Second lieutenant. <laughs> the way to approach him is walk, hey, lieutenant, you shoot a grid, lady? Then when he did take the time and all that, then we had to move back to where we were. But, uh, it's like I say, another politician thing. Uh, we don't want to be over on their side because if they consider an act of war, what the frig were we doing, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, the whole thing, Vietnam War didn't come out till way after I was out. When I was over there, it was a friggin' armed conflict. We weren't even a police action. Yeah. We were a hostile action. Jesus. My experiences from Vietnam left the greatest impression on you. Left the greatest impression on you? Yeah. Oh my God, I don't know. Probably coming back home and going back over and seeing that the way we were treated when we came back home. Uh, so we used to fly back in. We'd stop at El Toro, which was a Marine Air Base, refuel the plane and go on and we'd fly out. Or we'd stop there, we'd fly out of LAX to come home. And like when I came home on, on leave and that. It's called basket leave. It was free leave. I had extended on another tour, so they'd fly you home from Vietnam for leave. Fly me home from Vietnam. I'd have free airline tickets, uh, guaranteed seat to my home. My leave would start when I got off the plane at Nida County Airport up here, uh, and my leave, uh, my 30 days would end when I got back on board that plane, and then I get back to uh, Travis Air Force Base, fly out back to Nam from there. But coming home, California, hippies, uh, stuff like that. Salvation Army, wonderful people, rolled the red carpet out to the plane, you know. Same people gave us a Bible and Kool-Aid when we went over. Red Cross sucked. Red Cross sell you a donut. <laughs> red Cross is not one of my favorites. Uh, when did you receive your discharge? Well, I was released from active duty at uh, about June 24th, 1970, when I came home after my third tour. The discharge came, you're in for six years. I'd have to look, I've got it in here, I'd have to look at it. I think the discharge is in here, it's at home on the wall. But I went in on the delayed uh, entry program April 14th, 1967. So it would have been six years from 67, April 14th, I would have been fully discharged. 
when I came home, released from active duty, you're assigned a reserve unit way to hell out in Kansas or something. You're never going to go there. It's just what you're called a relay, released from active duty. And I can tell you something about that too. Coming home, last tour, uh, the Army, apparently they came and did everything like in a matter of hours or a day. Marine Corps, you know, all tradition, everything else. We were out there for seems like a month, I think it was like three or four days getting released. And finally when we got all our paperwork and all that, they announced we were going to have one more formation. The one more formation was going to be to let us know that we could get uh, airline tickets, two-thirds fare, three-quarters fare, half fare, something like that, anybody so desiring and everything else. If you wanted to stand in another friggin' line, most of us would just go, you know, wanted to get to the airport. But I remember he was a corporal. When it was all done, he said, wait a minute. Get out in front of the formation. And he had this whistle. He had this whistle like you're like a high school coach. Has. He goes, <laughs> he said, I want to say one thing. For all the lifers on this base, for all the brass, for all the people in Washington, he blew the whistle and goes, Boop! Fucking game's over, and that's it. And he left. <laughs> and I thought that was, I thought that was great. You can't, you won't see that in Reader's Digest, you know. <laughs> but I thought that was, that was the epitome of it because I think at the end, everybody that came back after a while and realized you, you know, you fought to come back. What was coming home when the walking was there walking? <clears throat> Uh, if you had some real close friends or something, they were glad to see you. Other than that, it was, you know, well, when you're out, I gotta get a job. Uh, it wasn't really, even in a small town like Oriskany, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't any banners waving or anything like right. that. No fireworks going on. Any public resentment about the war? If there was, I don't think. No one said it to me because, I, I mean, I was a different person. I don't think anybody that knew anybody, uh, I mean, I had some real good friends and stuff like that. You all do. You all think that you're going to know everybody you're going to school with for the rest of your lives and believe me or not. You may hit one or two reunions, you may go to a mall, but you're just going to lose track as you always run into other people. But. Uh, but as far as voiced resentment out in California, yeah, for sure, and stuff yeah. like that. But I was not the same person that uh, left when I first came home. I know I wasn't. So, I used to be the class clown. Right. And it took me a lot of years to get that back, get a sense <laughs> of humor back. Um, you had a lot of weed. I had a lot of bullshitters that were back. I had one kid, uh, I won't mention his name on here, but he was in the Marine Corps and we were in a bar in Oriskany one time. And in fact, it was uh, Tony's. And he sat on one end of the bar and he was just talking bullshit. He was talking about how he was with the unit and the boots took the fins off the rockets so they'd come in quiet. Well, you know, yeah. and horseshit like this. And I had a friend of mine who was 4F, never in the service, Ronnie Andrews Chubb, we called him. What's he mean? He said, Bob, why don't you go and tell that asshole what a jerk he is telling all that bullshit. And I looked at Ronnie and said, Ronnie, you were never in. And you know it's bullshit. So why would I have to bother? Because that's the way it is. You got a lot of uh, war heroes in this goddamn country right now that never even saw combat. Hell, they had uh, he was a lieutenant commander in the Navy. Mm he -hmm. was wearing Navy Commendation Medal of Combat V, and he killed himself when it, when it was published that he didn't even wasn't even entitled to that. I mean, you have to be entitled. I've got one. You've got to be entitled to it. It's on paper. It's on your DD-214. You get the, the paperwork with it. But he had a lot of people. I mean, I had all my ribbons. So you get a, a ribbon for each medal. Mm -hmm. And that's what you wear in uniform. You don't run around all the medals. Now. Yeah. Uh, I had them stolen in Okinawa when I was coming home, right off my friggin' uniform. It had a dry clean. Now I don't know what good they would do anybody. It, it's a 
felony if you're caught wearing something that you don't know you're still in and you're not entitled to it. So it's against the law to actually sell military medals. Yeah, I've heard of that. But what they do is, I know because my father-in-law, may he rest in peace, had lost his Purple Heart coming back from Anzio, the ship went down or something like that. My wife and I, I mean, he had it on record, my wife and I bought him one. The way we bought it was through uh, that Vietnam magazine, one of the ads in the back from South Carolina. It's a trade item. It's what they tell you is it's $49 for shipping, you send them one United States government postage stamp and they will trade you this one metal for it. So that's how they get around it. And I'm going way off track. Oh, it's funny. Oh, I got a question. No, how'd you, I know Bill Clinton was the president, and I figured that, I, that he was a draft dodger. Did you hear about that? He went to Canada. I know all about Bill Clinton. How'd you, Clinton. How'd you feel about that? I know that I our president. I could have saluted this son of a bitch. I couldn't have saluted him. They'd have had me in the brig. Commander in chief, no, I couldn't have saluted him. No one that I couldn't have respected him. I've seen pictures of him at different units wearing their hats and stuff like that. I think it took a lot of balls for him. I think he might have better kept a low profile on anything concerning the military, even though he's our alleged commander in chief. I think uh, I don't think I'm alone in this either. Good morning, it's, it didn't make sense to me that a president could become a president and be around military when he actually wanted to draft the gun. Well, you know. there's a separation between the military and the government. You know, you can't have a dictatorship and all that, but but it's just the times. It's the way things are. It's just, he was elected, Christ, he was elected after, you know, he was having his knob polished by two different people and stuff yeah. like that. It's just, at the time, people, people looked at the former president, George Bush, who was great on anything military and foreign affairs and sucked down the country as far as economy. Right. So people got to the point with Clinton where they wanted, let's bring our economy up. And as long as he's doing a good job in this country on the economy, to hell with foreign affairs and stuff like that. And that's just how it goes. Right. Yeah. Any closing comments? Anything you want to say? Oh, Lord, I don't know. I was there three times, there was just so much, so much went on. I, I wish the hell that uh, Gerald Ford got his balls up and, and, and the North Vietnamese came down with all their tanks and that, we'd blown the shit out of them with our air power, you know. Uh, I don't know if you could overstep Congress on that or not, but I know that I sat here in this country in a period of about two weeks, watched every bit of ground that my feet touched go under. And it, it just sucked. I mean, we promised these people. You know, I, I've heard now lately, oh, civil war. It was their civil war. No, no, no. There was two separate countries by treaty. Crisis like North and South Korea. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't a civil war so much as it was an aggression from the North wanting the South. As far as the people of South Vietnam, honestly, most of them just wanted to have a life on the heat. We used to spot NBA and uh, PC suspects by if they watched our birds going over to see where they were heading. Because the normal guy out in the rice paddy, he just wanted heat. And I, I for a time, uh, didn't like the Arvins, the Army Republic of Vietnam, Arvins. Um, didn't think they really were willing to fight or anything like that. And then I, I happened to be assigned to them one time, the 51st Arvin recon by force. And uh, so I wish they would fight. And I had a lieutenant or captain, his captain, uh, Dai Wee, spoke English. And we got talking one time. And I said, you know, Arvins don't have a very good reputation for fighting and all that. I didn't want to offend him. And he said he understood. He said, but I had to understand. I had to understand this. I was over there doing a tour where I would go back home. The Arvins was their country. And he said, if I was to think back to our civil war, and let's say I was in the South. 
and I was fighting for the South, for my homeland, and they lived there. And we'll say, England decided they were going to send 500,000 troops over to help. Would you be in a hurry to run out and die if you knew that this unit of foreigners was going to go out? And it made sense. In other words, why should I stop a bullet? I've got my lifetime living here to stop a goddamn bullet. If this guy wants to step in front of me, so be it. And that's the way it was explained. And that it's one of the few damn things that made sense to me as far as the, the mindset. I mean, I've read a lot since about Arden's, you know, and stuff like that, about how uh, the VC would actually send <laughs> There are men to enlist in the Arvins because they turned around and would get free training for them. Combat training and the fact that the Arvins had to stop issuing weapons uh, because the weapons were winding up in the wrong hands, stuff like that. What I mean by issue, I mean if they were in boot camp and all that, they didn't get to keep their weapons. Yes, so. Closing, all the only thing I can say for the future is if you're going to fight a war, make your mind if you're going to fight it. And if you're going to send in one man or ten men, ten a million, send them all. If you're going to spend a dollar, spend a billion. Get it done with, get it over. And remember, no matter what you see on television, like uh, what I call Star Wars, you know, which was uh, the Gulf War, when it's all done and, and you're watching the TV and seeing all the smart bombs and everything else land, you got to remember two things. One, somebody's dying there, and two, somebody else is going to have to go in and make sure that you're dead on the ground. And the probably the easiest thing in the world to do was kill a guy. The hardest thing to do was live with it. And that's about it. And it's been a long goddamn time. Thank you. <laughs>